Okay, so now it's uh, one o'clock, so we'll, we'll uh, resume um, uh, the afternoon session on math crypts. Uh, we have Travis Russell speaking on a uh, public key crypto system based on stabilizer codes. So Travis, you can take it away whenever you're ready. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, so thank you to the organizers for putting this together uh, and for giving me a chance to speak. Uh, sorry, I couldn't be there in person. Uh, uh, and, and my apologies if you hear children screaming in the background or anything like that. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, my colleague Ljubljana Beshai at West Point. Um, so as you can see, this is about a, a crypto system that, that, we've, uh, that we're proposing. Um, and I'm gonna start with just a very broad strokes overview of what this is, kind of the cartoon version. Uh, then I'll, I'll go through some mathematical preliminaries and, and then I'll give you a more, uh, uh, a more careful uh, description of, of the protocol. And hopefully there's a little time I can say a few words about, about the security of it. So um, our goal is to construct a, a classical public key crypto system, which leverages quantum technology. So what I mean by that is um, the goal of this crypto system is to transmit like bit strings from Alice to Bob. So Alice has a bit string, a string of zeros and ones she wants to send to Bob, but we're going to send it over uh, some kind of uh, a quantum infrastructure. So we're gonna take the bit string and use it to encode a quantum state, which is then transmitted to Bob. Bob's gonna perform a quantum measurement to extract the, the classical message. Um, so this is, this is gonna use um, a, a public key, which is just a, a binary matrix. Um, for encryption, and that's going to allow the allow Alice, the sender, to uh, build a quantum circuit for for sending messages. Basically, uh, there's also a private key which Bob has, and it's going to play a couple of roles. Uh, the first role that it plays is we're going to use the private key to initialize a quantum state, which we call the tableau. When I say tableau, I mean like a blank slate. Um, so this is a little different than most public key crypto systems in that there's going to be two transfers of information. So there's sort of two points where you could potentially have uh, information stolen. So um, some issues to think about, um, but we're gonna use the private key to initialize a quantum state and, and later we'll use it to decode things. Uh, so we initialize this quantum state, which we call a tableau. Bob sends the tableau back to Alice. Alice then encodes her message through the quantum circuit that she's constructed uh, based on the public key. And then she sends that encoded message back to Bob. Bob performs a measurement based on his private key, and that reveals the message that, that Alice was, was trying to send. Um, so that's very roughly what the protocol looks like. And then I'll go into more details once I build up some of the mathematical preliminaries. Um, it, sort of heuristically, like roughly why do we think this might be secure? Obviously there's some weird things with the two different transfers of information, um, because we're sending quantum states back and forth, um, we have this no cloning theorem uh, in quantum information, which says that you can't, take an, uh, you can't take an arbitrary state and just make copies of it. Um, so that gives you some physical justification for security of sending messages over quantum uh, infrastructure. Um, also the private key that's in use here is not unique. And so Bob has the ability to generate a whole bunch of random private keys and use whichever key he wants. And, and that's going to help uh, with the security. Um, but we'll explain more about that in a moment. Um, everything that I'm gonna describe is based on stabilizer codes, which were developed in the 1990s by Daniel Gotsman. It's sort of the bread and butter of uh, quantum error correction. Um, and the most similar quantum protocols that we're aware of uh, are uh, super dense coding and something called quantum mechalese uh, so super dense coding is, is a, a very uh, well-known uh, protocol for sending classical information over quantum infrastructure. Um, there's no public and private key in super dense coding. You assume that you have shared entanglement between Alice and Bob. Uh, in our protocol, we don't assume any shared entanglement. So in that sense, it's maybe less resource intensive. Um, and then quantum mechalese is another crypto system, um, which is also based on stabilizer codes um, but in that case, you have it's it's more like just a generalization of Mechalese. So you have like a unique uh, private key that, um, in theory, could be um, you know hacked by someone who has the public key with enough com computational power. Um, so slightly different. Okay, 
Uh, so that's some background and an overview. Um, so here's some of the mathematical ingredients that we use. Um, I, I know there's some other talks about quantum things, so I'll try to sort of make this quick. Um, uh, so some of the quantum machinery that we'll need. Um, so recall that if I have a complex n by n matrix uh, U, uh, it's called a unitary if its inverse is its um, conjugate transpose U dagger. Um, and a matrix P is called a projection uh, if it's Hermitian, so it's equal to its conjugate transpose, and it's also equal to its square. And whenever you have a projection matrix, it's literally just projecting vectors onto a subspace of Hilbert space. Um, okay, so there's many ways you can formulate uh, quantum mechanics, uh, but uh, for the purposes of this talk, a, a state is going to be a unit vector in a Hilbert space. Uh, and the Hilbert space we'll always be working in is the n qubit Hilbert space. So we have the n fold tensor product of the two dimensional Hilbert space with itself. Um, a quantum operation, uh, this is how we're going to encode the messages later on. Uh, so a quantum operation is a map that takes a state and maps it to U, uh, state phi and maps it to U phi, where U is some fixed unitary. And I guess the important thing here is that um, it, U does not change based on the state. So whatever state you're given, you just spit out U phi. And then a quantum measurement is how we're going to decode information. Roughly, it's a way of um, extracting classical information from a quantum state. And uh, mechanically, the way it works is we have a set of projections, P1 through Pn, uh, which sum to the identity operator. And uh, a measurement is going to yield one of the values, uh, 1 through n. So it, it yields some discrete value, uh, but it's non-deterministic. So the probability of getting the value a from a measurement is uh, you take the norm of the vector p a times phi squared. Um, so for every phi that you give me, I get this sort of discrete probability distribution over the, the numbers one through n. And that di distribution changes depending on the phi that we're starting with. Um, OK, so that's sort of the ground rules for, for quantum mechanics here. Uh, we're going to be working with stabilizer groups, uh, and stabilizer groups are subgroups of the poly group. So I want to tell you what the poly group is. Um, so recall the poly matrices. These are the two by two matrices X and Z that you see uh, right there. Um, and then I'm going to take these matrices and build some bigger matrices because I actually want to act on an n qubit Hilbert space. Um, so given a, a vector A, uh, so this is a, a bit string basically. Uh, a vector of zeros and ones of length n. Uh, I'm going to build the matrix uh, X of A, which is this n-fold tensor product. Uh, so when I write um, X to the zero, that means the identity operator. And when I write X to the one, that means X. Uh, so you have a tensor product of a bunch of matrices that are all either X or one, depending on the value of your vector. And similarly, you can do the same thing with the Z's. Uh, so the nth poly group uh, which we'll write as Pn. That's the set of elements of this form. You have x of a times z of b times some scalar. Um, there's only four possible values for the scalar, uh, plus or minus one or plus or minus uh, the imaginary number. Uh, and a and b are bit strings. Uh, so you can check that this forms a group. Um, it's a non-commutative group in general. So, um, and you can figure out how to sort of do the group operations by just thinking about uh, these x of vector and, and z of vector things. So um, if I just take x and z, the two by two matrices, they anti-commute. So x times z is minus z times x. Uh, and so if I were to multiply these big vectors together, um, it's, it's almost just a vector addition in z to n, right? So x of a and x of c gives me x of a plus c, z of b and z of d gives me z of b plus d, but then you have this uh, factor of negative 1 to uh, this is the dot product of b and c. Um, so it's non-commutative in general. Um, but you can figure out a lot of the necessary ingredients by just working over vectors, uh, which is what's going to uh, help us do some of the analysis later. OK, so that's the polygroup. Um, a stabilizer group is a commutative subgroup of the polygroup which does not contain the negative of the identity operator. 
And um, these, uh, like I said, were studied back in the 90s by Daniel Gotsman. Um, I'll just recall some properties of stabilizer groups. Um, the size of a stabilizer group is no more than two to the n. So um, the size of the poly group is actually four to the n. So these are sort of like small subgroups of the poly group, um, relatively small. And um, they can be generated by up to n independent generators. Um, because the stabilizer group is commutative, uh, it turns out that all of its elements are Hermitian. So uh, G equals G dagger, uh, which allows you to write them in this form. And uh, all, all I want to point out is that the imaginary number to the A dot B, that depends on A and B. So all the information about this element G comes from this vector A, the vector B, and then a scalar representing um, whether you have a plus or minus one in front. Um, so I can associate to G um, a vector, uh, which we write like this. So R prime of G is, uh, I'm thinking of this as a row vector here. So I have the row vector A concatenated with row vector B, and then I'll stick the C at the end. And that tells me everything I need to know about, about G. Um, the scalar term, negative one to the C, can be ignored in a lot of the calculations. And so we also have an R of G without the prime and you just ignore the C in that case. So it's just A, B. Um, so a lot of the calculations that you do with stabilizers, uh, you just work over this vector space. Uh, so uh, one thing you often need to think about is whether elements commute. Uh, a stabilizer group is a commutative group, so all of its elements have to commute with each other. And you can check that by looking at these um, R vectors. So if R of G is, a, B, if, and R of H is C, D, it turns out that G and H commute if and only if uh, this product defined here is equal to zero mod two. So this is a sum of two dot products of binary vectors. So, um, so we'll do that dot product mod two. If it's zero, then they commute. Um, it's not the usual dot product, right? So we have A times D and then B times C. It's like this twisted product. Um, okay, so we can check if things commute. Um, and then we can do most of the group operations just as vectors in, in this um, binary vector space. So um, R of GH is just R of G plus R of H. I just add vectors together. The identity corresponds to the zero vector. Um, you can also check for independence of the group elements. So G1 through GK are independent in my group if and only if the corresponding R vectors form a linearly independent basis for the, the image of the group under this, this R map. Um, so what all this does is it lets us get a correspondence between stabilizer groups and binary matrices, which we're gonna take advantage of later. Um, so just to explain that correspondence, um, suppose I have a matrix A with K rows and two N columns. I can always write that as a concatenation of matrices. So I just take B to be the first in columns and C to be the second in columns. And then I'm gonna define an operation on, on this set of matrices here. Uh, I'll define A star to just be, take the last in columns and make that the first. So basically shift everything to the right uh, mod in, uh, in units, um, or mod two in, in units. Um, okay, so uh, we have the star operation and, and now I can uh, identify um, these stabilizer groups with certain sort of matrices with nice properties. So given a matrix with K rows and two N columns, um, there exist uh, independent elements of the polygroup G1 to GK generating a stabilizer group uh, where the R of GI is the ith row of that matrix. Uh, if and only if this property holds A star, A transpose is zero, and the rank of A is K. Um, and, and the idea is you check that the entries of this matrix uh, are just these star products, so you're just making sure that everything commutes. And then the rank of K, uh, excuse me, the rank of A equal to K means that uh, the rows of A are linearly independent since it has K rows anyway. Um, so, um, so that gives you the independence of the group elements. Um, so all this is just so that we can sort of compute stabilizer groups, uh, which will be useful later. Um, last slide of preliminaries. Um, so um, we'll also be working with stabilizer codes, 
Okay, so given a stabilizer group in the poly group, uh, the corresponding stabilizer code is a set of all vectors H in our in qubit Hilbert space that are fixed by every element of the group. So GH equals H for all G in the group. Um, if the stabilizer group is size two to the K, then uh, the dimension of the stabilizer code is two to the N minus K. So there's like an inverse proportionality. Um, in particular, if your group is size two to the N, you're going to have a one dimensional stabilizer code. And that's going to be the case for most of the, the rest of the talk. Um, and if I have a unit vector inside this stabilizer code, we'll call that a stabilizer state. Um, last uh, little factoid that I'll use, um, the projection onto a stabilizer code uh, has this kind of uh, convenient uh, uh, formulation. You just add up all the group elements and, and rescale by the size of the group. Um, so we can write down these projections. And um, this is going to allow us to build the kinds of measurements we need for decoding later on. Okay, so um, that was all the mathematical ingredients that I'll need. Uh, now I wanna describe uh, the protocol in a little more detail than I did earlier. So my goal is to transmit a bit string vec A from Alice to Bob. And um, before um, anything happens, uh, I need to come up with a public key and a private key. Uh, so we're gonna choose a stabilizer group H in PN, that's gonna be the public key. And we're gonna publish it as a binary matrix. Uh, this is the matrix whose rows correspond to generators of H. And um, it's not unique, so you have to choose, this is H1 through HN, you have to pick the order of those things. Um, but um, that's how we're gonna publish uh, the public key as a matrix. And then we're gonna randomly generate a secret key, uh, which is another stabilizer group in PN. Um, it can't be any stabilizer group. So I'll explain what our possible choices are in a moment, but, but we'll see that there's a lot of options for, for G. Uh, so now the protocol looks like this. Uh, Bob will generate the tableau, which is um, a unit vector from the stabilizer code of G, G is the private key. Alice will receive the tableau from Bob. She'll perform a quantum operation. So she'll multiply phi by a unitary based on uh, the stabilizer code H and the vector A that she wants to transmit. Uh, so I'll define that unitary uh, in just a moment. Uh, and then Bob will receive the encoded state, uh, phi sub A. He'll then perform a measurement, which I'll define in, in just a moment, based on his private key. And that will reveal Alice's me uh, message uh, with 100% certainty. Um, okay, so that's what the protocol looks like. So uh, what I owe you is an explanation of what are the possible Gs, uh, what are these unitaries, and, and what are these measurements? So I wanna go through that on the next couple slides. Uh, okay, so the possible Gs, the possible private keys, we're gonna call suitable private keys. So, so given a, a public key H, a suitable private key is another stabilizer group G with the following property. Uh, for every non-trivial element of H, there exists a, a G in, a little G in big G uh, that anti-commutes with H. So GH equals negative HG. And you have to prove that given an H such a G exists, I won't go through that, but, but that can be done fairly easily with linear algebra. Um, okay, so why is this going to be our, our suitable key? Um, suppose I start with a stabilizer state. So phi is a unit vector in the stabilizer code for G. So it's fixed by all the elements of G. Um, let's take an element H from uh, little h from big H, that's going to represent uh, Alice's message uh, that she wants to send. And then I'm going to pick a, a G from G that anti-commutes with H. Um, and now consider this. I'm going to look at G, H, phi. G and H anti-commute. Uh, that's the assumption up here. So uh, I can switch the order. That gives me negative H, G. But now phi was in the stabilizer group 
uh, stabilizer code rather for G. So G times phi is just equal to phi. So now I have negative H phi. Uh, so what that tells me is that G times H phi is equal to negative H phi. So H phi is an eigenvector for G with eigenvalue negative one. Phi, on the other hand, is also an eigenvector for G. It has eigenvalue one. And G is her mission. That was a, a property of state elements of stabilizer groups. So that means that H phi and phi are orthogonal to each other. And this is what's going to allow us to do decoding. Um, if H is uh, not equal to H prime, for instance, so if I have two possible messages that I want to distinguish, H and H prime, the inner product of H phi and H prime phi, that's equal to the inner product of H prime H with phi. Uh, H prime H phi with phi. Uh, so that's using uh, the fact that H prime is her mission. I can move it over. And, and now that's uh, zero. Uh, so H prime H is non-trivial. Uh, and so these are orthogonal to each other. So you can distinguish different H's. Um, and that's going to allow us to do encoding and, and decoding. So here's how encoding works. I have my VEC A uh, that I want to transmit. And I have H, which is given to me as uh, generated by these specific generators, H1 through HN. Um, I'm going to define the unitary, uh, my quantum operation, to just be this product. So it's H1 to the A1, H2 to the A2, et cetera, multiply all those together. Uh, that gives me a unique element of this group H, and every element of H has this form. So uh, for the decoding, I'm going to use take a PG, that's projection onto the stabilizer code. And uh, I'm gonna generate a whole bunch of projections by taking PG and conjugating by these U of A elements. And uh, this theorem basically says that we can do encoding and, and decoding successfully. So if, if I start with my tableau phi in the stabilizer code of G, um, and then I encode my message as phi sub A, then measurement of phi sub a by this set of projections is going to yield the vector a with certainty. So I've indexed my projections by these vec a's and um, my measurement's going to spit out the right message. And the idea of this is, um, so recall that if I take the norm squared of an element like this, that's the probability of getting vec a, uh, you show that that's one. So pga times phi a, that's pg conjugated by ua, times u a phi, so this becomes a u a squared. Uh, but u of a is her mission and unitary. So when I square this, I get the identity that goes away. P g times phi is just phi and u a times phi is phi a. So in the end, I get a unit vector. Uh, this norm squared is one. So 100% probability I'll get this a here. OK, so um, that's how the encoding and decoding works. Um, and I realize that I'm quickly running out of time. So let me just skim through a few um, final properties um, so I can say a word about um, sort of what our future work is going to be and, and, and something about the security of this thing. Um, OK, so you, you, given a, a private key H, uh, you have to generate, uh, excuse me, given a public key H, you have to generate a private key G. And I said there were potentially many of these. Um, so you can characterize them by using matrix properties. They, they correspond to matrices which satisfy certain relations. Uh, and uh, again, sorry, I'm, I'm going to fly through these slides. I just want to describe in words um, some of these things with a little bit of time I have. Um, so it turns out that once you have one uh, private key, you can generate all the others in sort of a canonical way. Uh, to do that, you need uh, a symmetric n by n binary matrix, uh, any, any random symmetric matrix will do, and then a random vector um, of uh, length n a binary vector. And from that, you can generate a new key with new generators. You can write down nice formulas for them. Uh, and because they correspond to just symmetric matrices and vectors, we can count them. There's approximately two to the n squared such keys. Um, so there's a whole bunch of random keys. And once you've calculated one of these private keys, uh, you can pretty easily generate the others. So it's easy to randomly generate um, different, different private keys. Um, 
I don't have a lot of time left, so let me just say um, we did consider some potential attacks uh, on this thing. Uh, one kind of attack is just a brute force attack where Alice sends one message and, and Eve randomly picks a key and tries to extract the message with a quantum measurement. Um, unsurprisingly, that's not going to be very successful. It's no better than guessing. Um, but um, the reason that we consider this in the first place is because um, we have the no cloning theorem. So we can't just make a bunch of copies of phi A and then test it out with a lot of different G primes. Um, that's, that's not gonna be possible in general. So it's good that that fails. We also considered a letter frequency attack, uh, something more complicated. And we showed if you give Eve some, uh, a lot of power with a very, some generous assumptions, I guess, um, there is a chance of this kind of attack being um, successful. Uh, but then there's an easy way to thwart it. Basically, uh, Bob needs to uh, use a different uh, private key every time there's a transmission. Uh, but we can randomly generate those, so that's not too bad. Um, I'm a bit out of time, so maybe I should just uh, pause for questions rather than uh, describing my, my um, potential future work here. So um, thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Questions for Travis? Any questions for Travis? Uh, Kate has one. Um, I'm curious if uh, if you can boil down the security of this to a sort of easily uh, statable hard problem or assumption. I'm not really sure with the quantum aspect to it. Thanks. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure. Um, uh, it, it's hard to say because, um, really the security comes down to, you know, what can you do with quantum measurements? It's, it's not like it's, you know, equivalent to factoring or something like that. Um, so it's, it's really hard to say. This is the second bullet point of our, of our future work is that, um, in, in, in this work, we really only considered the possibility that Eve just picks a random private key and does the measurement the way that we say a measurement should be done. In reality, uh, an eavesdropper could use any quantum measurement that is possible. And so the analysis of that's uh, going to be a bit more complex. And so we have a lot of things to think about. It's not clear to us, you know, is this just equivalent to, to something that we already know about? Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Hello. So if I understand correctly, you, you're actually using quantum communication in this protocol. Yes. And so then what would be the advantage over QKD, which achieves a similar functionality and is information theoretically secure? Yeah, one potential advantage is that, um, well, so I guess there's various formulations of QKD. So um, device independent QKD relies heavily on entanglement and, and we don't need any entanglement. So that's one potential thing. Um, the other thing is that uh, because it's sort of asymmetric, we have a private key and a public key, um, there might be some advantages to that. So of course, QKD is a protocol for distributing uh, a pair of keys. Uh, so it's, it's sort of symmetric um, and while physics guarantees some security of that distribution, um, it always comes with an asterisk. You know, you, you have to implement this thing very well. Uh, you have to implement QKD very well in order for that to really be secure. Um, so there may be some advantage to having a public, public and private key system uh, versus uh, QKD in certain scenarios. But um... and, and just one other follow up, if I can. Is there an obvious brute force computational attack on this? Um, all you can do is, yeah, yeah, really all you can do is randomly generate a key. Um, so given H, um, you generate one key and then all the other keys are uh, coming from a randomly chosen symmetric matrix and a randomly chosen generator. And it's really easy to jump from one uh, thing to the other. So basically you've got a set of two to the n squared private keys that you're just 
uh, going to um, select with uniform probability. There's no like, you know, uh, unless there's some like canonical choice that the that Bob is using, unfortunately, um, then, then no, I don't think there's an easy way to generate a private key. Thank you. Sure. Okay, I think uh, we, we need to get the next talk started. So let's thank Travis uh, one more time for the great talk. Thank you.